Hey fellas, Felipe Caravelli here. Welcome back to the second part of my Retro MP40 tutorial. If you haven't seen the first part yet, make sure you check it out. I'll also have the link for it below in the description. The first leg of this tutorial will cover the modeling for the low poly gun from the ground up, using a side view reference and using my workflow techniques for making guns for the indie game Father. Also, make sure you're following Father's developed Thomas Brush on YouTube and wishlisting this beast on Steam. Links can also be found below. Alright, so the first thing that we want to do today is taking care of cleaning up all these parts of the gun individually. Essentially, we're getting rid of any edges, faces and vertices that we see that are unnecessary. We also want to make sure to triangulate or quantify faces whenever possible, meaning instances that have zero effect on the geometry and shape of your model. In other words, we can and should merge vertices but being extra careful to not pinch, distort or mess up the mesh in any way. Okay, Felipe, so I really don't feel like spending time doing this. What can happen if we leave these faces as end gons, meaning faces with more than four edges or non quads? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'll tell you exactly what happens. So the game engine, being Unity or Unreal, will look at your model and say, you lazy bastard, and it will take care of triangulating the faces automatically when you import the model. The problem with that is that the engine will do it without any discrimination it can't tell which direction you want the vertices to be connected. So yeah, in a hard surface model, generally speaking, guns, furniture, buildings, or anything that doesn't have a organic look to it, that might not be a huge issue, but sometimes not being thorough can create some really weird rendering issues. And it's known as being a best practice whenever you're making models, especially for games. So by doing this manually, we're essentially telling the engine and the world how we want this model to look, ensuring that this face will look exactly the way we want. Feeling powerful already? Me too. And I'm not gonna lie, this can be a very time consuming process and you're only really gonna get good at this by doing it over and over again and training your eyes to spot whenever you find like an edge that is unnecessary. And I gotta confess to you guys, sometimes I still mess up and forget something, especially when I'm on the clock. But it's a very, very important step and trust me, your game dev team will love you for this. Also here, this is a great example of what not to do. You gotta be careful sometimes when you pull the vertices around and you're not seeing what's going on in the other sides or in different angles. So make sure that you're paying a lot of attention to that too. Otherwise you're gonna end up with a really messed up mesh and it's gonna be too late. All right, I think we did a pretty decent job on this piece. So now we're gonna apply a mirror modifier to complete the other side and we want to make sure that we're checking bisect that way we don't have to do this cleanup all the way on the other side it saves us a bunch of time it's all about working smart and not hard and we can also get rid of that middle loop and move on to the next piece Okay, so this is another good example of what not to do, and it's a very rookie mistake, but sometimes we can do that if we're not paying attention to what we're doing. So if we were to select this whole loop here and delete that, that would mess up this model pretty bad because essentially we'd be deleting a whole face, a whole side, I should say, of that cylinder. So we wanna actually pull and drag these vertices manually, and it shouldn't be all the way to the back anyway. We should just have to do that a little bit more here and then call it done and move to the next piece.
And you know what? I think I'm just going to do some last minute modeling here. We're going to go ahead and add that cylinder piece that is on the MP40 on the side. I think that's going to add something a little bit more interesting to look at because I think we can get away with the amount of uh, polys that we're doing here. Okay, so for some really weird reason, Blender decided to play dirty with me and it doesn't want their mark sharp function to work correctly in our model. I have absolutely no idea why this happened and I even tested starting a new project and it's fine in there, but not here. So for the sake of this tutorial, I cheated a little bit. I imported the model into 3ds Max and then I brought it back to Blender and now it's working. If any Blender users have any idea as to why this can happen, please let me know in the comments below. And if you're like, what the hell is Felipe talking about? I'm referring to these light blue lines. So what I'll do is probably the best way to explain what these lines do is by removing them. There you go. So it looks all washed out because what the Mark Sharp tool will do is essentially telling the model which faces are supposed to be smooth and which ones are supposed to be sharp. So if I wanted the model to look completely flat, like a super, super retro 3D model with all these horrible jagged lines, you can, for the purpose of aesthetic, just leave your model like that. But that's not what we're doing here today. What we're gonna do is select all the edges that we want to use as a limit for our smooth faces and you will understand what I mean in a second. There you go. So this is basically a way to cheat when you have a really, really low poly model, but you still want to keep those faces looking smooth without adding any extra geometry. And more importantly, it will make things look right for the workflow we're going to apply later on Substance Painter as well. We're going to continue selecting those edges and continue to apply the Mark Sharp function. Make sure that you have your reference image open as well in case you get confused about which ones you should be doing that or not. Now that I'm looking at this part here in the back, I just realized that we can also get rid of some of these um, extra edges here. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that. And that's totally fine. I mean, like I said, sometimes they're right there in your face, but you end up missing them. And I'm sure I'm leaving some here that you guys uh, might see. If you see one, please let me know in the comments. I'll, I'll find that really amusing. All right, so now we're gonna move into a completely different territory, which is unwrapping this model and getting it ready to be textured correctly. And we're gonna work on each piece separately as well and making sure that we're fixing any mistakes as we see them. And by the way, I have installed the Text Tools add-on for Blender, which is a fantastic free-to-use plugin that is also available for other 3D applications. I actually use it a lot on 3ds Max for unwrapping. So as you can see here, it comes with some textures that are essentially used to help us understand how this model's UV coordinates is currently looking like. And obviously we can tell that this is not looking right right now, unless you're going for, I don't know, a lollipop or your Austin Powers interior decorator. So remember all that extra work that we did with the Mark Sharp tool? Well, I'm also gonna use another fantastic Blender add-on called Interactive Tools. And we're gonna use the sharp information to help us tell what are the UV islands for our model. So we can see all these red lines that are on top of the light blue lines that we set before and this will again save us a ton of time. 
So we want to check that button and then we can go ahead and start unwrapping. Now we can see right away that there's something wrong with this piece here. And if we select the faces, we can tell that it is from this cylinder. And that's because we need to tell the 3D application where does the cylinder start and end by cutting it in one of the sides. So think of it as a sheet of paper that if you connect both extremities from the paper, you can actually form a tube or in this case, a cylinder. And normally we want to select the side that is the least likely to be seen by the player. So we probably don't want to choose the top one, but go with the bottom one. Okay, so we can see that we have the same problem here in the back for this cylinder. So we're going to go ahead and make sure we're cutting it in one of the edges. And we're going to do that following the same edge loop we selected before, just as a best practice. So if you selected a different edge in the previous cutting operation, make sure at least to continue the same loop as it will probably look a little bit more consistent. So we're going to select all the faces of this object and unwrap it again. And there you go. Problem solved. Another thing that I noticed is that this piece doesn't go all the way up like this. There's practically a 90 degree angle that we want to mark a new seam and also make sure that we remember to mark sharp. The last step that we want to do is make sure that these pieces that are actually straight are also being displayed like that in the UV. So we're going to use the text tools once again to help us out. Go in edge mode inside the UV editor and select the edge we want to use as a reference. Make sure you're doing that for any other piece that you find that is supposed to be straight. And it looks like we created an overlap here, but don't worry about that right now. We're going to fix all those later with one click. So it looks like this piece for some reason doesn't want to follow the unwrapping correctly. I even checked to see if there were any unmerged vertices, which is something that you probably want to do sometimes, but it could be just a glitch. But that's okay, because we can actually use a different method to unwrap this. So select all the faces that you want to unwrap, make sure that you are on orthographic view and not perspective, otherwise this is not going to work, and then select project from view in the unwrap menu, and bam! Let's not forget the other side of this piece as well. Select all the faces you need. Set your camera in that angle. And project from view. Now that we're done with all the pieces, we want to select all the faces of the model. It looks like a mess right now, but we'll take care of it. So you want to click in UV and then pack islands. Now there's no overlapping faces anymore. Blender will give you a couple extra settings to tell how close each UV island is to each other. I probably want to leave it at that. This is a very unrefined method though, because as you can see, there's a lot of wasted blank space that we could actually manually reorganize and take more advantage of. Because when you scale things up with having extra room to work on, that actually increases the overall resolution for each face of the model when you apply the texture later. 
I'm not going to do that here for the sake of this tutorial and for what this model requires, but it's something that you most definitely want to spend time on, especially if it's a high resolution model and texture. All right, so let's select all the pieces of this model. Make sure you have selected everything and we're going to apply a brand new material to it and give it a name. So let's just call it the MP40 and make sure you're changing the viewport shading to preview material. And it doesn't really matter which color. It's just so that we know that the material was applied to all of them. This is another one of those particularities with Blender that you actually got to link the material to all the pieces and then you'll know for sure that everything now has the same one. Now that we have everything set, we're going to click on File, Export, and it's up to you what you want the output file to be. I normally use OBJ or FBX, but most of the time FBX these days. You don't have to change anything here, we can just go ahead and export the file. And I think it's a good time again to take another break before we take this into Substance Painter. I was initially going to do this in two parts, but I don't want to really make long tutorial videos if I can help it. And honestly, the whole next step could easily be a tutorial on its own and I don't want to rush anything. I want to bring the best quality I can offer to you guys. So we'll see each other in the next final video for the series. I hope it will come out at the end of this month if I have the time, because trust me, it takes a long time to actually write the script, record myself, edit this video and have everything good to go, especially when I have a lot of other things going on. I actually don't do this full time. And the MP40 I'm working on with you guys here is actually just for this tutorial. At the time of this recording, I already finished all the weapons I was supposed to make for Thomas. So this one is not the one I sent over, but it's very, very similar. So yeah, make sure you guys are leaving a comment below. Let me know if there's anything I need to work on and hopefully you guys enjoy the second part. See you guys then.